Dr. Helene Langevin received an MD degree from the McGill University, followed by a postdoctoral research fellowship in neurochemistry at the MRC Neurochemical Pharmacology Unit in Cambridge, England. Residency in internal medicine and fellowship in endocrinology and metabolism at Johns Hopkins Hospital in Baltimore. She currently is research associate professor in the departments of neurology, orthopedics and rehabilitation and director of the program in integrative health, University of Vermont College of Medicine. Dr. Langevin is the principal investigator of two NIH funded studies investigating acupuncture, connective tissue and low back pain. Good morning. Well, it's a great pleasure to be here and I want to thank you so much for inviting me and, and, and I really want to tell you how honored I am to be your honorary president. I think that uh, physiotherapy brings a, a unique and extremely important contribution to acupuncture, to the, to the, the world of acupuncture. And I'm very excited to see all of you here and so, so many of the, to hear many of the good ideas that you're all are coming forth and I, I really hope that uh, research in uh, the combination of physiotherapy and acupuncture together can really flourish. So today I'm going to talk about uh, connective tissue and this is something that uh, all of you are a lot more familiar with than <coughs> most of the audiences that I speak to uh, sometimes. But just to kind of review uh, briefly where connective tissue fits in the realm of musculoskeletal tissues. And uh, I think that it's fair to say that connective tissue gets pretty short uh, shrift in, in, in most discussions of musculoskeletal uh, anatomy, physiology, pathology. In general, when we talk about musculoskeletal tissues, the tissues that we uh, are concerned with, most people are concerned with, are the bones, the cartilages, the muscles, you know, and other things like intervertebral discs, for example. Um, connective tissues themselves, even when people do talk about them, they're usually referring to specialized connective tissues. The, the tendons, the ligaments, the joint capsules. And so um, if you look, for example, if you do a PubMed, you know, search, and, and you start looking for, you know, research done on, on different types of mesenchymal tissues, connective tissues, um, you'll find 99.9% .9 of the research is about these things. Very, very little about the non-specialized connective tissues, the stuff that's everywhere, that's in between everything and everything else, the fascias, the, the, all the loose and dense connective tissues that infiltrate all the organs, that wraps around all the nerves, all the blood vessels, that separates all the muscles, the perimuscular and intramuscular connective tissue that really is absolutely everywhere. And um, I read in here a distinction between dense and loose types of connective tissue. I'm going to be talking more about that later because I think, I think it's very important. Connective tissue comes in, in a lot of varieties, but you, you know, dense connective tissue would be an example of that obviously would be uh, the dermis of the skin. It's a dense, you know, rather tightly packed kind of tissue with lots of collagen and, uh, and, 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 a, and a sort of a dense weave. Whereas loose connective tissue is what we call areolar. And these are the sort of less well-defined kind of loose connective tissue planes that separate things, that are in between the dense layer and allow for movement in between the layers. And very importantly, when for example, most of us, you know, learn our anatomy from just dissecting cadavers, and most of those are embalmed cadavers. And when you embalm a cadaver or fixed tissue, the loose connective tissue essentially just disappears. It's not there anymore. It, it, it kind of, uh, because it gets dehydrated and you lose it. The only way to appreciate the loose connective tissue is either in a, uh, at surgery or in dissection of fresh uh, cadavers. They're kind of difficult to come by. Um, so most people, <laughs> I mean, um, more and more anatomy uh, classes now are starting to try to obtain, you know, fresh cadavers that have been frozen and, you know, not to be a little macabre about it. But it's really the only way that one can appreciate this very, very important, in my opinion, part of the anatomy. So 
this connected tissue, as I mentioned before, forms a network. And the, the, the sort of the weave of dense and loose connective tissue is most apparent when you look at it histologically, when you do um, histology. Perhaps we could dim the lights just a little bit so that um, we can see the slide a little bit better. And um, both of these types of tissues uh, form, thank you, a matrix, okay? And uh, a matrix essentially is, is like a network. And uh, the network is not just a matrix network in the sense of, you know, uh, collagen and elastic fibers that form a sort of a, a mesh, but also inside this network there are cells. And the, there are many different types of cells in connective tissues, but the cells that are really the resident, I would say the primary cells of connective tissue are fibroblasts. And these are the fibroblasts that actually manufacture the matrix. They make all the collagen, the glycosaminoglycans, all the important proteins that are in connective tissue that compose it. But also, interestingly, the fibroblasts themselves form a cellular network. They, are con they make contact with each other. And they, they have these important types of proteins called connexins that are at the junction between cells. And so we don't know yet what type of communication may exist between these cells. But at least the, the anatomical structure of it supports the fact that they are a cellular network. And this is an area of very intense investigation uh, in my lab. So, um, now, the important thing about this network is that it is mechanosensitive. What do we mean by that? It means that the network responds <coughs> to mechanical input. All right? So, this is what the fibroblast network here looks like when the tissue, this is a piece of mouse connective tissue, that is simply placed, placed between two rubber grips and stretched and left alone for two hours. And the cells in the fibroblast look like this in a non-stretched tissue. If you do not stretch it, okay, if you just simply put it in the grips and do not stretch it, you just leave it in a loose kind of uh, state, the fibroblasts have a small cell body and long <coughs> processes like this. And here's the nucleus in the center. In contrast, if you stretch the tissue, the fibroblasts look like this. They look very wide and flat, and then extended, what we call the melipodia. These are the extensions of cytoplasm and go in every direction. This is a pronounced, very, very dramatic change. There's a change in the cross-sectional area of the cell that can be as much as 200%. This is not just a passive, this is not just a simply passive stretching of the tissue. This is an active cytoskeletal mediated change. It means that the cell is actively reorganizing its structure, its internal structure, in order to respond to the change in the tissue uh, length. Now, we've also done experiments in vivo where we can stretch the tissue without taking it out of the animal. This is a mouse that was put under anesthesia and essentially stretched like this. One side of the mouse is made longer than the other. In this case, we waited 30 minutes. And we looked at the cells on the extended side versus the non-extended side. The, you cannot stretch one part of the body without, you know, uh, shortening the corresponding contralateral part, right? And so the, stretch, the cells were larger on the stretch side compared with the non-stretch side. What that means is that this is a physiological phenomenon that occurs all the time in response to changes in, in tissue length probably happens if you're sitting in a chair, right? The back of your body is stretched compared with the front. And then as you get up, it, the, the length redistributes. The front becomes longer and the back becomes relatively shorter. And so uh, we think that these types of cellular responses um, occur in order to adapt to changes in body position. These are not instantaneous changes. It takes several minutes for these cytoskeletal rearrangements to take place. We start to see, we start to be able to measure it at about five to 10 minutes. Probably starts occurring a little bit earlier, but this is not something that happens in seconds. So if you simply extend your arm and put it back, that's not gonna happen. You have to extend it and leave it in that position, okay, for quite some minutes before the changes start to take place. Now, interestingly enough, the same type of response occurs with acupuncture. And how does acupuncture do this? Well, this is something we found some years ago where uh, I, I was just looking at the effect of inserting an acupuncture needle into the body and what happens to the connective tissue when you do that. 
And here's an example. This is the right abdominal wall. And you put the needle in, and then you rotate the needle. In this case, we rotated it quite a bit. This just kind of to exaggerate the effect. But what happens is the collagen, which is staying blue here, spins around the needle and winds around like around a spool. And this is a, an ultrasound picture that shows this. It shows the tissue winding around. Oh, <laughs> sorry. And what happens when that happens is that tissue essentially gathers, okay, around the needle. It comes from the periphery and gathers towards the center, towards the needle, and essentially gets stretched as a result of that. So the needle is kind of stretching the tissue from the inside of the body. And so if you look at the fibroblast, this, this is when the needle, this is again a little setup, where we have some mouse-connected tissue with the needle connected to a little motor, and it rotates when we want to be able to do these experiments in a very controlled way. So the motor rotates the needle exactly, always the same distance. And um, so the fibroblast is when the needle is simply inserted without rotation, look like this. You see again, small cell body, long processes. But then, and I don't know, I'm sorry, this is a little bit dark, maybe we could dim the lights even more just for now, just so you can see this. But in the, after the needle has been rotated and waited about 30 minutes, the fibroblast now becomes very, very large, just like what I showed you before. <coughs> Large cell body, extended cytoplasm. I don't know, can you all see this? It looks very, very different. It looks like the other one, um, that, uh, like the stretch tissue that I showed you before. Interestingly enough, this is very dose dependent. Okay, so this is an example where we do we use bidirectional needle rotation. We get a needle that goes back and forth, and uh, we use different doses. So this is half a turn, so 180 degree turn. Eight cycles, 16, 32, and 64, okay, so it's a different, different amounts of back and forth rotation. And here it's eight cycles, but increasing the amplitude. Each cycle was here <coughs> half a turn, a whole turn, and two full turns. And you see that, and then we looked at the same things, so that we measured the cell body cross-sectional area of the cells, how large the cells got in response to this 30 minutes later. And so we saw that there were these peaks of response. In this case, one turn times eight cycles, and here, half a turn times 32 cycles. But if you, if you rotated more than that, then you did not get as much response. If you rotated less than that, you did not get as much response. So there was these, these peaks of response. And the reason why we think this occurs is because when you rotate back and forth, the <laughs> tissue winds around the needle a little bit, and then when you rotate back, it winds back. But it doesn't wind back completely all the way. So every time you wind, you rotate, winds a little bit more, a little bit more, a little bit more, and finally it reaches the stage where there's enough tension built up in the tissue that the fibroblasts begin to expand. So this is very, very dose dependent. Okay. Now, where do you see this? How far away from the needle? So we did these experiments again where we put the needle in and we rotated the needle. So area C here, which is in the center, is right where the needle, just a couple of millimeters on either side of the needle. What you see in this area is a whole bunch of wound up collagen. It looks a little bit like a mess. The fibroblasts are caught up in this kind of whirl of connective tissue and it looks a little bit kind of wounded and broken, but it's not very big. It's only maybe a millimeter across. But then when you look a little farther afield, okay, a couple of maybe half a centimeter to a centimeter and a half away from the needle, okay, on either side. This, again, this is in mouse connective tissue. This is not human yet. Uh, when you look on the, on the side here, you see that this, the fibroblasts do expand. And even when you go three centimeters away from the needle, the cells still look larger in the rotated sample compared with the non-rotated, okay? So what that means is that, and this, this now extends all the way around the body of the mouse. So it's really a, a, re a response that is not simply confined to where the needle is. It's in a mouse anyway, it's really several centimeters away from the needle. And that's a long distance in a mouse, okay? Now, about a human. So, well, we cannot cut up the human and look at its fibroblasts, right, after we put the needle in. So we use a technique called ultrasound um, and imaging, well, it's called ultrasound elasticity imaging, but it really is essentially taking an ultrasound movie and uh, using robotic acupuncture, using a specialized robotic instrument to insert the needle precisely in the plane of the ultrasound. And then we look, using the ultrasound, 